session to me, Arjun Bharadwaj ji. Namaste sir, and now the session is all yours. Didi, I'm not able to get the voice of Arjun ji. Are you able to? Uh, Hello, namaste. Namaste. Yes, namaste. Namaste. Welcome. Namaste, sir. Namaste. Are you able to see me and hear me? Well, uh, uh, we can see you. Not able to hear? Uh, we are able to hear you as well. Okay. Uh, could you, uh, yeah, I can share the screen as well, right? Yeah. Okay, please let me know when I can start. Yes, the screen is absolutely visible. So, uh, Arjun Bharadwaj is going to talk on Hindi temples, Hindu temples, engineering marvels. So it's going to be a session on the engineering marvels of the Hindu temple. So you can start straight away. Okay, okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank the AICTE and Dr. Rajat Vasudev Murthy for uh, coordinating uh, these talk series and giving me, me an opportunity to share some of my learning with you all. Uh, let me start off with a prayer. Chidananda Kalamvanim, Vande Chandra Kalatharam, Nairmalyata Ratamyena, Bimbitam Chittapitishum. So I have been uh, told that I can keep my talk for to about uh, 50 minutes, and the last 10 minutes we'll have uh, some question and answers. That's so, right. So, uh, yes, please. Yes, that's perfectly all right, sir. Yes. Ah, okay, okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk about the Hindu temples and very specifically about uh, how they are great in engineering marvels. I'll, I'll be uh, throwing light on some aspects of the engineering behind uh, the construction of uh, Indian temples or Hindu temples. Before I go in there, let me briefly introduce what a Hindu temple actually means, what a temple actually means in the Indian culture. So there are two kinds of uh, concept or two streams of uh, concept here. One is the spiritual temple and the other is the structural temple. Now, most of us think that temple, uh, when we talk of, when we use the word temple or the Sanskrit equivalent Devalaya, we are specifically referring to that structure, which we today understand as a, as a temple, which in any common Indian would uh, relate to as a temple. But however, in the Upanishadic uh, concept of the temples in the Indian Upanishads and the Vedanta tradition. There is this famous statement which says, Isha Vasya Midam Sarvam. So the statement itself means that the entire universe, the entire creation is the residence of Isha or of divinity. So the entire universe itself is the house of God. So for Indians, for the native Indians who today we refer to them as Hindus, a temple is not merely an exclusive place or a structural entity, but the entire universe is a temple itself, which is the residence of the divinity. Isha Vasya Midam Sarvam. Similarly, if you if we go into the uh, etymology of the word Vishnu, we also get the uh, get the etymology as Vyapnoti Ti Vishnu, Antar Bahishchanarayana, etc. We hear such uh, statements in the Indian tradition. So again, the entire universe is pervaded, is percolated by this entity, by this divinity called Vishnu, also by Shiva and also by Devi. Uh, Diva Kridayam, Diva Vyapane. So the, the root word Diva from which the word Devi comes also has a kind of all encompassing, all pervading kind of feature. So therefore, for the native Indians, there is nothing which is not a residence of divinity. In fact, uh, in a more philosophical sense, the Maitreya Upanishad and the Bhagavad Gita also say, Deho Devalaya Proktaha, the human body itself is the residence of divinity. So for us, 
temple is not merely a structural entity, but it means something much more than what we see as a physical structure. So for example, it's only in the Indian culture that, the, that a river is worshipped as an abode of divinity. See, we have Ganga Arati, we have Yamuna Arati. We also worship the confluence uh, or meeting point of two or more rivers, such as we have the Prayagaraja, which is also called uh, Tirtha Raja, uh, or Triveni Sangama. So confluence point of two rivers is uh, worshipped as a temple. The confluence of uh, the rivers and the sea, for example, the picture which I have shown here on the left side of the bottom is the Ganga Sagara Sangama, which is in the Bengal region in India. So that is revered and that is uh, given a lot of importance. Similarly, in the Indian tradition, we have the culture of worshipping a hill as a temple. So the Arunachala, the, many of you might know, the Arunachala, the hill itself is a temple. In fact, there is this tradition of going around the hill as Girivalam or Giri Pradakshinam, whereby we uh, admire and adore and we have great sense of devotion to the hill itself as a manifestation of uh, Shivalinga. Similarly, we have the concept of worshipping trees in the Indian culture. See, it's only in the Indian tradition, in the native Indian culture, that everything can become an object of worship. Everything is divine for us. We just uh, finished the Navaratra and the Deepavali uh, festivals. There, many of you might have uh, celebrated in the Navaratra celebrations, many of you might have observed that we worship every object in the house. On the Ayudha Puja, especially, we worship the vehicles, we worship uh, two wheelers, four wheelers, three wheelers. We worship all the objects in the kitchen, uh, the refrigerator, the stove, etc. And we worship knives, we even worship a laptop, a smartphone, a computer, etc. Everything is an abode of divinity for us. And we have festivals where we worship, uh, uh, where we worship trees, we, uh, where we worship animals. We worship great people as Tirthas, or they are also called Tirtha Rupas. Uh, for example, we have uh, we have festivals, or we have the tradition where we worship Vyasa, where we worship Buddha, where we uh, worship Mahavira or Valmiki, or any of these great people are seen as embodiments of divinity. In fact, one's own parents are seen as Tirtha Rupas. They are called Tirtha Rupas uh, in the sense that they are the ones who have given us birth. And this birth is for us to help cross over from the material to the spiritual realm. So that's what the very word Tirtha means. So anything and everything can be divine for us. So that's the bigger spiritual concept of the Indian Devalaya. Going ahead quickly, uh, the word Devalaya comes from a combination of two words, two root words, Diva, uh, which is uh, the root word from which the word Deva comes. The word Divu has the meanings Krida, Vijigisha, Vivahara, Dyuti, Stiti, Moda, Mada, Swapna, Kanti, Gati, etc. So Divu means, uh, and link is the other component of the word Devalaya. Link uh, has the meanings Dravi, Karane, and Shleshane. So Devalaya, to put it in sum, Devalaya is a place where we can lose ourselves, where we can forget ourselves, where we melt down in a playful joy, in, uh, um, in a radiance, in brilliance, in art, etc. So there are multiple dimensions of meaning for the word Devalaya. So now quickly going ahead to what the structural temples are. So that was what I uh, spoke so far was the spiritual concept of a temple. But now, uh, like I've already mentioned, there are these things called the structural temples, which we are uh, largely familiar with and which we address largely by the word uh, temple in, uh, in the English language, Deva in uh, Sanskrit, Deva, Devil, etc. in Kannada, Odia, Telugu and uh, such the languages, Koval in uh, Tamil and uh, uh, Malayalam. So we have other structural entities also, which we refer to as temples. Now, to quickly uh, mention this, people have the tendency to say that a temple is just a religious structure, like the church is to the Christians and the mosque to the Muslims. But however, from the multiple records of inscriptions that we get in several uh, different temples, and also from the texts of Dharma Shastra and Artha Shastra in the Indian tradition, we get to know that a structural temple was, yes, it was a place 
where people could come for worship, but it served several different purposes. So it was the socio-economic hub of people. See, even today, uh, uh, a couple of months back, when several temples got shut down due to the lockdown because of the pandemic, because of uh, COVID-19, we come to know that so many people lost their jobs, be it the flower vendors, be it the fruit vendors, be it the uh, sweepers, the cleaners, the purohits who worship in the temple, or uh, even the chapel stand keepers. So there are people from different strata of the society who come and participate when a function, when a temple is functioning, and there are multiple people, mul people from different disciplines who will have to pour in their expertise in the construction of a temple. We'll soon be going into that when I talk about the uh, engineering aspects of a temple. So structural temples are not just religious places; they are also socio-economic hubs. In the past, until about fifty or even hundred years ago. Uh, the structural temples worked as seeds of justice. So the rulers of uh, uh, kingdoms, they used to go and give justice to people in front of the divinity. So they considered themselves as mere tool in the hands of divinity. And it's uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the approval of the divinity that they are uh, uh, ordaining certain laws or uh, giving certain kind of justice to the people. So it was a seat of justice. And in many cases, the structural temples were rescue centers and asylums. We come to know from several inscriptional records that whenever there was a famine in the entire kingdom, the temples would give money from their treasury. They would give grains and uh, the basic uh, necessities for people from their gra uh, granaries, etc., and would take care of the needs of the people whenever there was a, uh, there was a famine or when there was a pandemic, such as uh, in the past, there used to be plague, cholera, and several such uh, diseases. Whenever people were in trouble, they could go to temple to take shelter. So it was a rescue center. It was an asylum for people when they were in need. Also, when there were natural calamities such as floods, or uh, uh, when there was an when there was a foreign invasion, the temples could act as fortresses where people could be housed safe. In fact, uh, many of you might. Uh, have heard of this, uh, the picture that I uh, show on the top right uh, uh, here on the right side, you see that there are tall gopurams on each of the four directions. In fact, in the Vijayanagar period, these tall gopurams would act as outposts or outlook or uh, watchtowers. So people could get safely housed within the temple complex and the soldiers could walk along uh, around the walls of the temple uh, complex protecting the people who were housed safe within there. Well, the, this picture is from Tamil Nadu, but all that I'm saying is that in such uh, uh, temples where you have several prakaras or uh, several boundary enclosures, which are usually concentric and uh, they are expansive outwards, they could work as fortresses in several cases. The temples were also education centers, like many of you might know. Several gurukulas, several patashalas uh, would uh, take place within the uh, temple system. And in fact, uh, several art forms were nurtured and developed within the temple complex. There used to be dance schools, music schools, and uh, different forms of art, such as painting, sculpture, theater activity, etc., used to be encouraged and nurtured within the temple complex. I see that there are quite a number of comments. Is it something about... Uh, Okay, I'll uh, take the questions at the end uh, and uh, uh, kindly don't interrupt in between. Uh, it's kind of uh, distracting. At the end, I'll spend about 10 minutes uh, taking in all the questions. Yeah, that's the Meenakshi temple for people who uh, asked me. Uh, there were the centers of education and the, that was the epicenter of art. Several different art forms developed in, in, the, in the temple complex. They were places of historical documentation. In fact, uh, several historians, starting from uh, D.C. Sarkar, R.C. Majumdar, and several other scholars say that the epigraphy evidence, evidences from epigraphy or inscriptions that we find in temple, that's one of the primary sources for historical study in India. Because like you might have heard in other lectures also, Indians 
we Indians had a cyclic concept of time and this linear concept of time is before Christ and after Christ. The Western phenomenon. It's uh, uh, from the. Uh, uh, it's uh, only when the Europeans came to India we got that linear sense of time, having uh, BC and AD, or before the Common Era and after the Common Era. These terms uh, uh, came to be in use only later days before the common era and the common era. But we had a cyclical uh, nature of uh, time, conception of time. And here, the temple inscriptions provide us with a lot of evidence to document history and to understand uh, history. So now, it's interesting that it's not just Indians who understood the importance of a temple. It was also the innovators who constantly came, especially uh, from the Middle East, the invaders who came. They constantly ransacked the temples. They too understood that the temple is the heart of Indian culture. And if we destroy the heart, if we destroy the nucleus, well, then the entire ecosystem of India could perhaps get uh, destroyed and they could conquer it. So with that intention, most invaders, invaders who came to India, they constantly uh, destroyed the temples, knowing the importance, how it has multidimensional capabilities and how it can cater to people of uh, different strata of the society. So that's briefly about what a structural temple is and the uh, different uh, kinds of utility and the different kinds of purposes that a structural temple could serve. So now slightly going ahead a little further and my, now focusing more on the uh, engineering aspects of a temple. See, there are several dimensions from which a uh, temple can be examined. One can examine it from the religious perspective. I'm just using these terms very loosely. So as in the terms of rituals and uh, how temples are uh, abodes of the belief system of the Indians. So one can examine it in that from that dimension. One can also see the aesthetics of a temple. Uh, temple, especially the art forms which are housed in the temple complex. One can examine it from the perspective of aesthetics or from the perspective of philosophy or from the perspective of history. So there are multiple streams from which one can approach the understanding of a temple. Today, I'll limit myself to giving a bird's eye view of some aspects of engineering uh, related to temple. So amongst the oldest surviving structures which could classify, which could get classified as uh, temples are the stupas, which we find in Sanchi. They are about 2,300 years old. A stupa, like most of you might know, is a Buddhist structure. It is also called a dhatu garba. A dhatu is uh, a sacred object, a sacred relic from the Buddhist tradition. It could be the tooth of a Buddhist monk, a Buddha about the bhikshu. It could be the nail of a about the bhikshu. It could be a strand of hair, or it could be his bhiksha patra, the begging bowl, or the red robes that he would uh, wear. So it could it would be housed within a stupa, and this uh, semi uh, spherical structure would be built around it. So what's very interesting is that if we the, the very fact that we have got this, these perfect structures, which are largely hollow inside, they are largely hollow inside, 2,500 years back, these kind of structures were built. So if the Indians had to arrive at this kind of symmetry, this kind of proportions, and these kind of long-lasting structures, one can only imagine the amount of technology or the amount of engineering and the amount of uh, thought flow that must have happened before 2,500 years. So if they were able to ar arrive at this structure in 3000 BC, quite a number of centuries, quite a number of millennia must have uh, gone behind it in perfecting the construction of a structure like this, which is hollow inside, largely hollow inside. For people who are more interested, you can certainly go through the works of uh, Dr. Percy Brown, Dr. Stella Krambrish, of uh, uh, Dr. Anand Kumar Swami, Kapila Vatsyayana, and a few other people, where all of these are discussed in detail. I'm just pointing at uh, some aspects, some engineering aspects. So this is the Sanchi Stupa. See here, this is an independently standing structure, as in uh, uh, on a plain land, they have chosen a plain uh, piece of land and they have uh, built the structure there. But there are other kinds of structures in the Indian tradition, such as uh, the cave temples, cave temples or the cave Chaityas, the cave Viharas, which we uh, find in the Maharashtra region and the Madhya Pradesh region. So these are the Karla caves belonging to the 2nd century BC near Lonavala in Maharashtra. 
what's very interesting at these marvels is that whereas a structure like the sanchi stupa is an independently built structure you bring in uh, stones or bricks from different places and assemble them in a place so even if you make a mistake in assembling them you have a chance to correct it you have a chance to replace the brick you have the, you have a chance to replace the stone etc but however these rocket these kinds of rock, rocket architecture is cut out from an already existing facade of a mountain or uh, from the face of a hill or from an already existing cave see here you are not building uh, you are bringing you are not bringing external entities and uh, putting it into the cave but this structure you already have a cave and you must be very accurate in your accurate in your measurements and in bringing out this kind of finesse in uh, in the architecture see these pillars etc and the above entablatures that you see at the top they are added here largely for an aesthetic feel see it's a cave which naturally existed for a cave temple the pillars are not a must they are not structural requirements because a cave will stand independently by itself anyway but these pillars are added largely scholars say scholars like uh, dr ms krishnamurthy and several others they say that these were added to give it the feel of an independently standing structure see if it's an independently standing temple then it's natural to have pillars which can act as supporting structures for the upper entries the upper roof etc but here these kinds of pillars are added largely to give an aesthetic feel to this to these uh, cave temples and also perhaps uh, they wanted to be doubly sure of the structural support they give to the roof of the uh, rocket architecture see these are cut out from the facade of a mountain from the face of a mountain or out of a hill or out of a, a uh, cave so this poses different kinds of challenges you have to take out material from uh, the cave etc so while an independently st standing structure poses certain kinds of uh, challenges a rocket architecture poses certain other kind of uh, kinds of challenges and you need to have a different kind of accuracy here in rocket architecture see again you can see the elevation or the facade how they have uh, done for these ajanta uh, caves many of these are uh, from the buddhist period see again one thing we'll have to remember here is that only in the post independent uh, period that we have got this tendency of classifying buddhism as a separate religion a religion according to our constitution but in india in ancient india buddhism was just an offshoot of the mainstream sanatanic culture of the mainstream what we today call as hinduism so it was not necessarily considered as an other entity which is different from the uh, mainstream hinduism so we'll have to keep that in mind so i'm throwing light on the buddhist structures because they are also essentially uh, rooted in the native sanatanic culture now if a few things regarding the materials that were used in the construction of temples uh see many of you might have observed that the construction of a temple will need uh, people to have the people who participate in the construction of a temple will need to have different kinds of uh, knowledge uh, they'll have to be exposed to or uh, they'll need to have expertise in different branches of learning starting from the selection of site of a temple so we see in india there are temples which are built on hill tops there are temples which are built on sea shores which there are temples which are uh, built uh, in the ghat section when there are when there are sloping edges of mountains at different places different kinds of temples are built so one will need to have a very thorough knowledge about the territory of the land and the weight bearing capacity of the soil and they will also have to key, uh, pay attention to the locally available material and they will also have to think about how they will transport the raw material from one place to the other see to start with you will need to know the topology of the land and the soil properties you will need to know the locally available material and you will have to have some kind of technology to transport your raw material from one place to the other then after having done that you will have to see what kind of dimensions what Uh, you can uh, build with a certain kind of material for example if you have uh, 
sandstone, you can build temples of certain height. If you have granite, you can build it of uh, certain other dimensions. If you are working with soapstone, then your temple structure will have to be different. If you're working with wood, your temple structure will have to be different. So depending on the material, the temple structure can change. And also you'll have to have a very thorough knowledge about of geometry and arithmetic for different kinds of calculations that are involved in the building of a temple. And there are several other things which a person will need to know. I'll quickly throw light on uh, some of those aspects. So from one of the inscriptions that we see in, uh, uh, in uh, the Tamil Nadu region, it's an inscription at Mandakapattu in the South Arcot uh, re region of uh, Tamil Nadu. It's an inscription of Pallava Mahindra Verma. It says it's a cave temple and Pallava Mahindra Verma in the inscription, he was a king. He says that the temple is very special because the temple is not built out of bricks. It is not built out of wood. It, there is no metal which is used in the building of the temple. And there is no concrete or brick, brick or mortar used in the construction of the uh, temple. He says the Sanskrit inscription reads as follows. Etat anishtakam adrumam aloham asudham vichitra chittena nirmapita nrupena brahmeshwara vishnu lakshitayatanam. So this cave temple is very special, he says, in his uh, 6th century uh, CE inscription. He says it's very special because the temple is not built out of bricks, wood, metal, or concrete. So what we get to know from this inscription is that it was very common to have temples to be built out of bricks, wood, metal, and concrete. And this is special because none of those materials are used and it's a naturally uh, cut out rock structure. So that already throws light on the awareness that the Indians had about the material properties of different kinds of materials that can be used for building huge structures, which can also be long lasting. And uh, this inscription is in the Grantha script, uh, by the way. Regarding scripts, it's a totally different study. Uh, uh, each symbol in a script will correspond to one kind of syllable and that uh, corresponds to the kind of pronunciation that you have. I'm sure that uh, you would have had some kinds of sessions uh, regarding the pronunciation of the Indian alphabet, the different letters in the Sanskrit alphabet. So inscribing on stone itself is a different kind of technology, which people certainly had, like you see from here. Now quickly going ahead, like I said, you have uh, different kinds of uh, temple architecture that you see in India. Amongst the earliest freely standing Sanatanic uh, structures are those uh, uh, which are called the Pantavaratas, which are present in uh, the Mahapalipuram region which was in, in the past called Mamallapuram. You see the evolution of our temple structure here. I won't go into details. People who are more interested may kindly refer to the works of Dr. R. Nagaswamy, Padma Bhushan, Dr. R. Nagaswamy. He has done extensive uh, study on uh, the temples of India as a whole, and in specific about the Chola temples and the Pallava temples of uh, Tamil Nadu. There are two, there are three kinds of uh, temple styles, Larchi, the North Indian temple style, which is called the Nagara, the South Indian style, which is called the Dravida, and very loosely put, a mixture of the North Indian and the South Indian temple uh, styles is called the Vesara. This Vesara is a kind of a technical word which has different connotations. Let me, let us, for now, for today, let us loosely keep it as a combination of the Nagara and the uh, Dravida styles. So the North Indian temples are the Nagara. So to quickly give examples for these, a temple like you see on the left side, this is from uh, Bhuvane, Bhuvaneshwar. If you have, if the vertical lines in the temple are more pronounced, such as the one you see on the left top corner, I'm specifically talking about what is called the Garbhagruha and the structure around it. The structure around a Garbhagruha is called a Vimana. Looking at the shape of a Vimana, one can uh, decide the uh, style of architecture. So if you look at the Vimana here, it has more pronounced vertical lines starting from the bottom until the top. So this kind of uh, architecture is called a Rekha Nagara. Rekha itself means a line from the bottom till the top. You have a common straight line pattern. Uh, it's radially symmetric. And in uh, very loosely put, in a Dravida kind of uh, architecture, which you see on the 
uh, right hand side, you have a stepped pyramidal structure and the horizontal lines are more pronounced, like you can see uh, quite well here. These are the horizontal lines, which are more pronounced and it's a stepped pyramidal structure. Again, while uh, deciding that style of a temple, we'll, also, we'll always have to keep in mind the Garbhagraha. Garbhagraha is the place where the main deity, the Vigraha of the main deity is placed. The structure around it, the structure which encompasses it from the bottom till the top is called the Vimana. Looking at the Vimana, we uh, decide the uh, style of construction. So that's the Dravida. And this uh, uh, term called Vesara, which has an other kind, which is a mixture of the Nagara and the Dravida, it has both vertical lines which are pronounced and the horizontal lines which are pronounced. So this is a temple from uh, the Hoysala period of uh, Karnataka. You have vertical lines here and also the horizontal lines which are pronounced. I'm just very loosely telling these things. There are multiple temples with uh, these kinds of structures. Now, a few other uh, inputs into the uh, about the engineering marvels that the temples are. Uh, the Chola architecture itself is very interesting. Uh, so between the 9th and the 14th century CE in the common era, you we have several Chola temples which were built in the uh, largely in, in today's Tamil Nadu and in Kerala region, and also in the southern part of Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. Uh, many of you might know this uh, Brahadishwara temple built by Rajaraj Chola, which is in the middle, the, which, which I put in the middle. That's a marvel in itself. I'll speak about it uh, soon. That can even be uh, categorized as one of the wonders of the world. This one which I'm pointing to here is the Kailasanatha temple in Ellora, which belongs to the 7th or the 8th century CE. It was built during the Rashtrakuta period. What's very interesting about this temple is that this is the Dravida Vimana. You have a stepped pyramidal structure for the Garbhagraha, the Vimana. But what's interesting is that this temple is carved top to bottom. See, usually you, you would imagine a building being constructed from bottom to top by assembling different uh, materials, which will be useful in, in constructing the building. But here, this temple was ha, has been cut out from the, from the face of a hill. The hill was, the hill largely consists of basalt kind of rock. And from top to bottom, it is carved out. Just all these entities, not just the Garbhagraha, what you see here is the Garbhagraha, and that is what you see back there, that uh, towering uh, entity is, the, is what houses the Garbhagraha. That and every other element of this temple has been carved from top to bottom. If, if, the, if the people who were working there, if the architects ever made a mistake, there was no way they could correct it. Because it's not built by building, bringing building blocks from different places and assembling them uh, together here. It's carved from top to bottom. Just imagine the creative genius that uh, they might have had. See, again, I would like to mention one thing here. Several Western scholars and several Indologists in India with ulterior motives, they have a tendency, a very strange tendency of saying, that these kinds of structures, whether it's the Brihadishwara temple of Tanjavur or this, uh, uh, this Kailasanatha temple of Ellora, they say that humans did not build it, but aliens came to India and built these structures. However, we have several texts dating to about 1,500 or 2,000 years ago, which talk about temple construction, the kinds of tools, the kinds of material, the kind of proportions you need to follow in constructing a temple. So if you say that aliens came and built it, you are underestimating the human capacity. Why do you think that humans will not be able to build such uh, structures? That's a, uh, that's a very curious thing. So again, there are uh, people with ulterior motives who just want to uh, sub kind of uh, stamp down upon the Indian spirit and uh, they want to induce an inferiority complex in the Indians. So we see uh, such statements being made. Anyway, uh, there are several other marvels, uh, like many of you might have noticed, these kinds of pillars, which are uh, cylindrically symmetrical in the Hoysala temples, that these uh, circular uh, pillars, the cylindrical pillars rather, they were made out of lathe kind of mechanism. Most engineering students here may know what a lathe is. Uh, that's used to bring in concentric circles on a piece of wood, a log of wood. But here it's made with stone. That's a very interesting thing. So we see development in uh, temple styles. That's a different uh, study in itself. 
And what's again very interesting is that in several temples, such as uh, the Ayuravateshwara temple in Dharasuram in Kumbhako, near Kumbhakonam, which was built by Raja Raja Chola in the 12th century CE, we have these steps which can produce music. See, we have heard of strings, such as in a guitar or in a veena or in a violin, which can produce saptasvaras, which can produce the 22 shrutis, which are required for, uh, for any uh, musical composition. But here in the Indian temples, we have stones which can produce music, which can produce the different swaras in the Dharasuram temple. And most of you might even have uh, known this in the Vijayanagar period, uh, in the Hampi region of Karnataka, you have this Vijayavitthala temple uh, built during the Vijayanagara period, where pillars can work as strings of a veena, can work like the strings of a veena, and they can uh, give rise to music. So one can only imagine the keen awareness, the, uh, the amount of knowledge that the Indians had regarding the material properties of stone, the air gaps within a stone pillar, and the kinds of dimensions, uh, the uh, dimensions of the different components of a pillar that they would need to have to bring out different kinds of sounds from a pillar, so from, from a stone entity. So these are amazing things which uh, we find in the Indian temples. One other very interesting thing is that today in the construction of most buildings, we have a tendency of putting the foundation for the construction of the building below the ground. We dig up the ground, we dig up the soil and then put the foundation. But these kinds of huge gopuras, which are called the Raya gopuras and also in fact Vima of the Brahadishwara temple, there is hardly any amount of foundation which is below the ground. You can even have foundation above the ground. It's a very interesting thing which uh, the temples, the Indian temples uh, kind of show us. So you'll have to have a kind of uh, proportion between the horizontal dimension and vertical dimension. If your foundation is this big and this thick and this high, then you can build a very heavy structure on top of it. So that's the kind of estimate they had and that's the kind of keen calculations that they had. And again, there are a few other things here. I'm left with only 10 minutes and uh, I have quite a lot of details to cover. In both the horizontal and the vertical dimensions, the proportions of different parts of a temple correspond to the proportions of the human body. So that's a study in itself. So one can go through the works of Dr. S.K. Ramachandra Rao who has thrown a lot of light on uh, these aspects. In fact, the nomenclature of different parts of the temple in the vertical dimension, they have close correspondence to the nomenclature of the body parts of a human being or of a deity. So that's a very interesting thing. Uh, the human body parts have a correspondence to the parts of a temple in the vertical and the horizontal dimensions, in the latitudinal and the longitudinal directions. So this brings to our mind the Upanishadic statement, Devo, Deho, Devalaya, Spruktaha. The Deha itself is uh, called the Devalaya. So here, philosophically, what we can see is that the structural temple is an external manifestation of this Deha itself. The Deha, which is the temple. Anyway, now I'll quickly throw some light about on the units of measurements that uh, people had uh, back in those days. One of the uh, basic units of measurements that I had is this thing called the angula. The angula was uh, the middle segment of the right hand middle finger of the person who was uh, sponsoring the construction of a certain building. See, that's a very interesting parameter to take as a basic unit of construction because if a yajamana, the person who is getting a house constructed is called, an, called a yajamana, Apparently, the, uh, the length of this segment, which uh, we call angular, that ha proportionately manifests or differs from people to people. It has a correspondence, it has a bearing on the height of the person. So if a person is uh, tall to whatever height he is, that has a bearing on the length of this angular. So it is I who is getting this house built. So the height of the house, the height of the roof, etc., should have some corresponds to my own body features. See, like you can see, there is not a universal standard that the Indians used. The standard is specific 
to the monument which is being built and it is specific to the person who is sponsoring the building of the monument because he is going to live or he is going to get closely associated with the monument. So if it's a residential structure, the angular measurement of the yajamana used to be taken because uh, usually uh, the man is the tallest uh, person in the house, the husband is the tallest person in the house, usually in most cases. So his angular measurement would could uh, give proportions for the height of the roof and uh, the height of the doorway, etc. If the temple was funded by an entire community as a whole, then the basic unit for measurement that would be taken would be based on the grains which naturally grow in that piece of land, in that kingdom. So if barley was uh, the grain which was naturally growing there, then the thickness of the barley at its middle, that's the highest thickness, if you imagine a grain, like, uh, like I have uh, shown here in the picture, the thickness of the middle of a barley, which is called the yavamadhya, would be taken as the basic unit. And eight times that would correspond to one angular. Again, one can go through the works of Stella Kramrish. It's a very interesting thing. Why would they take a grain which organically grows in a certain soil as a basic unit of measurement for building a man-made structure, for artificially building a structure? So the natural growth of a grain has, has a bearing, has, has some kind of correspondence to the man-made structure which is built on the same soil. So that throws some light apparently on the soil properties and the weight bearing capacity of the soil. Or rather, there's another philosophical concept here. I'm not going to all those details. There is this thing called the Vastu Purusha Mandala, which is made while building a temple. So the temple is seen as a union of the Dhyava Prithvi, from a union of the skies and the earth. Because of the union of those two, a temple takes uh, birth. That is what the Vastu Purusha Mandala story throws light upon. See, even these grains which are grown from the soil, it's because of a union of the skies and the earth. So that's the philosophical concept there. It's the rain from the skies which uh, falls on the earth, which gives rays to these uh, grains which grow on the soil. So the grains are uh, because of the unison of the sky and the earth. Similarly, the temples are also philosophically unison of the sky and the earth. So these were taken as the uh, basic units of measurement. And now what's also very important to know is that all our texts, all the texts on the temple construction or even residential con uh, complex uh, construction, they give specific dimensions or specific proportions, correspondence between the horizontal dimension and the vertical dimension. So we have several texts such as uh, the Mahimata, the, uh, 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 such as uh, the Ishana Gurudeva Paddhati, Samarangana Sutradhara, Kashi Prashilpa Shastra, Manasara, Shilparatna, Vaikana Sagma, etc. Several texts which were composed in different regions in India. So they give proportions of the horizontal with the vertical. So what many of the texts say is that if the width is say 10x, x being a certain kind of measurement, x being the thickness of the wall of the main component of the temple, the width can be 10x and the height can be 20x. Up to 20x, the height can go. So depending on the width and depending on the thickness of the wall, the height of a structure will be decided. That's very obvious. If you have very thin walls, you cannot build very high structures. If you have thicker walls, then your structure can be higher, obviously. But how, yet another thing which these point out is that if you have the width as W and height as say 20 W, then the structure will look monstrous. It will look like a monster. You might have seen several uh, uh, structures around the world, especially in cities such as uh, New York, where the uh, the surface area of the structure at the bottom level is very small, but the height is very huge. It gives a rakshas, a monstrous, demonic kind of feeling when you look look at those structures. I myself felt as though they were going to eat me up or they would uh, they were going to envelop me. But here, these kinds of proportions, which are you, uh, this, which are specified for the construction of a temple, 
give an aesthetic feel even when we look at the structure and one can be we'll be able to grasp the entire elevation and the plan in one go if these proportions are uh, kind of maintained so we have several proportions uh, given depending on uh, whether you have a production apata around agarbagruha or not and how many layered how many storied temple you are uh, planning to build so this is a single story temple like you can see here if you have multiple stories there are multiple uh, different kinds of uh, dimension different kinds of proportions that will uh, need to be followed just a couple of things about this uh, brihadeshwara temple and i think i'm already running out of time although i'm still in the middle of my uh, presentation this brihadeshwara temple is itself a marvel uh, the height of the temple is about 220 feet 217 feet to be precise it's built of uh, a magmatic granite and what's very interesting is that these kind of stones the stones which were used to build the brihadeshwara temple there were no quarries quarries of that kind of stone in the 50 kilometer radius of the temple construction site i'll repeat it in the 50 kilometer vicinity of the temple construction site there were no quarries of this kind of granite which is used for the construction of the temple so dr nagaswamy and uh, dr pierre pitchard in their uh, works on uh, the brihadeshwara temple which is published by the ignca they tell us how these huge blocks of stones were transported from very far off distances. Apparently, according to one uh, inscriptional evidence, uh, one local evidence that we find, some stones were brought on a river. So they had huge ships built and these blocks of stones were quarried. They were put in the, in the boat or the ship and they were rowed upstream on the Kaveri River until one point they were brought on the river. You, may, you can just think about the naval technology they must have had back then to, to build boats which would carry very heavy granite stones. So they were brought upstream on the river and from that point or from the river bank to this construction site they were brought on land so you can imagine the kind of uh, uh, the number of people who would be involved in the construction of the temple and the skill that the different people who participate in the construction of a temple were supposed to have in fact the very stupa here the topmost structure weighs quite a number of tons uh, if I remember right, it was it is about 60 or 90 tons, the uppermost entity. So to put it there at the top, it is said that they built ramps for which were 10 miles long, so about 16 kilometers long. Again, uh, there are different figures here, different uh, scholars give different figures. But obviously, lifting this stone to that height itself was a very difficult thing, which they very interestingly, with so much of effort, with so much of passion, they achieved it uh, very well. Just one small, a couple of small things about the uh, plan of this uh, Brihadishwara temple. One interesting aspect here is that the Brihadishwara temple, which is at Tanjavur, built by Rajaraj Toda, uh, he wanted to model it as Dakshina Meru. Meru is a mythical mountain, a Puranic mountain, which is supposed to be uh, very divine, etc. So this is a representation of the uh, Meru mountain. So that's uh, the, with that idea in mind, Rajaraja Chola built it. And obviously, in the Indian tradition, we do not step upon divine objects. See, we don't even step upon a book or even a pen, etc. We find a divinity uh, housed everywhere. So it's unimaginable for you to stamp upon the Meru mountain with your foot or even the shadow of the Meru mountain with your foot. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is that Raja Raja Chola designed the temple in such a way that the shadow of the temple always falls on the temple itself and it never falls on the production of Pata. So the idea was the devotees should never stamp even on the shadow of the temple. See here, then here in the entire vicinity, uh, in the entire structure, uh, in that enclosure, the shadow would fall. But the height of the temple was maintained such that the shadow would fall only largely on the temple complex itself. You can see the proportions here. So this vertical uh, height of the Vimana that has a, has a correspondence on, onto the entire temple structure. And this, uh, the uh, prakara or the entire temple periphery can be, uh, can be 
uh, classified or broken down into four uh, into three square, squares here. And you can see at the middle of the second square, you have the Nandi Mantapa, which is the Vahana Mantapa. In the middle of the first square is the Garbha Gruha. In the, at the middle of the, uh, of the third square is this second Gopura Dwara. And if you see here, again, it's a very interesting structure. From the top of the Vimana, uh, the a top line from there, it passes through the top of the uh, first Gopura Dwara and it uh, reaches at the end of the first square there, or rather the third square. And that along with a line from the bottom of the Garbhagruha that almost forms an isosceles triangle, et cetera. So the, this kind of precision they had in, even in the geometry of uh, the temple construction. Only when you have these kinds of measurements can the entire uh, uh, temple complex have an aesthetic feel. It can have a beautiful or a positive bearing on the minds of the devotees or the minds of the Konojias who visit uh, the temple complex. Again, there are multiple temples outside what we today consider as politically, the political geography of India. Uh, but in the past, the Indian subcontinent was very huge. Indian culture had spread, ha had a vast expanse starting from Iran in the West to Japan in the East. So this prominent temple complex is in Indonesia. So you can see the geometry with which uh, they have uh, built it. This is an aerial view. Similarly, similarly, the Angkor Wat, which is the biggest, the largest temple complex in the world, you can see the proportions that they have uh, followed there. And this is uh, Angkor Thom. You can see the kind of uh, detailing that they have uh, done on the Gopuras or the Vimanas rather. And similarly, so this is just about architecture. The study of sculpture itself is a different thing. There are multiple engineering marvels at the level of sculpture itself. So let me not take too much of time. I'll stop at this point. Um, today, the problem is that people appreciate temples for wrong reasons. Rather, uh, we have a tendency of superimposing science where there is no science, where we'll have to see it more as a philosophical perspective. And largely, the engineering which actually went in whether it's material science or civil engineering or uh, kind of physics and geometry and mathematics, which actually went in the construction of a temple is largely ignored. So again, if one can, uh, if the interested people in the audience, if you can go through the works which I just mentioned, then that can give you a very good engineering perspective into the construction of these structural temples. So with this, I'll stop for the day. I am left with only about six minutes, I think. I'll, I'll take whatever questions I can. Oh, yes, uh, Arjun Bharadwaji. This was something which really engineering students definitely should appreciate. So much of in-depth engineering into the construction of temple. I'm very sure that the, uh, most of the participants would be uh, highly enriched and, uh, and quite interested in knowing more about it. And I have uh, one of the students, uh, Dhanush. Dhanush, beta, you've already unmuted your mic. Would you like to talk to Arjun Bharadwaj, sir? Uh, yes. Hello. Yeah, please. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Please. Oh. Yes, yes, yes. I can hear you. Yes. Sir, uh, uh, even the technological aspects are carved in our temples, like the telescope uh, can be seen in the Hoysaleshwara temple. Hmm. And uh, uh, Vishwakarma. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes. Vishwakarma can be heard seeing uh, many unique uh, uh, devices like the modern day equipment. Uh, well, the point here is, yes, what you say is true. Uh, one can see certain kinds of devices this uh, temple sculpture are uh, holding. So that's a different study in itself. I did not even go into, uh, into the sculptures, what the sculptures uh, depict. I threw light only on the architectural aspects. Yes, there are several different things which uh, one can... Uh, uh, talk about. But one thing I would like to mention here is that today there are too many videos and too many articles circulating all over internet and uh, where they claim that uh, they are throwing light on the science behind temple construction or engineering behind temple construction. One will need to be very careful to examine the authenticity and the credibility of the speakers. So again, be sure to go through, the best thing would be go th to go through the primary sources. Primary sources are in the Sanskrit language. And to, we have lost connect with 
the Sanskrit language, which is the very native Indian language. That's a shame upon us, rather. So it would be best to go to primary sources or reliable secondary sources. There is too much of spam going around in the internet, claiming uh, to throw light upon the scientific aspects of a temple. So one will need to be very careful. One should not be over enthusiastic to over interpret uh, several uh, sculptures uh, as uh, evidence for uh, some kind of uh, science. All right. Thanks a lot for the point, for uh, the nice point, uh, Danush. Is there no, any yes, sir. Sir, I have a question. Go ahead, Vita. Sir, yes, so can you, can you please, you know, uh, list, list like good sources from where we can gain actual knowledge about the architecture and uh, uh, structural architecture of the temples, like on the chat box? Uh, okay, fine. I'll uh, do that uh, after about two minutes once I finish speaking. If there is an other specific uh, question, I can answer it or else I'll yes, just sir, uh, so, start. Uh, yes, sir. Like, uh, do you have other sources uh, than the ones you listed before? Uh, the ones which I listed are most exhaustive. Let me write them now. Uh, write them down now. Stella okay. Krampus. So, like, uh, I mean, you list you you were mainly saying that these are works of people, right? So, are they like papers? Are they like papers published, they or are they like books? They are books. So, yes, sir, these please... are books that I'm writing, putting down. Okay, yes, sir. So, could you please, you know, tell the titles? I'm putting it here in the chat. You can you may kindly have a look at it. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's good, Rishikesh. Mm, you so nice to know, uh, Miss. Diana Merrill. Ma'am, uh, ma like shall I to... ask a question? Yes, uh, please. Yes, Priyari. Sir, sir. Please the, your class was entirely curious and it has invoked a great sense of pleasure in me. Sir, Thanks I would a lot. like to ask you a question that mm -hmm. we know about this we are trying to understand about our architecture marvels and ancestral intellects all this right. way. Mm -hmm. So, after this, after understanding each and every part of this architecture, their style, their mis mysterious, not mysterious, their superfluous intellect, uh, which was behind it. Mm -hmm. What else can we do rather than being proud of this? As a part Very of good it was, a, as a, yeah, please, please go as ahead. It was yeah. a part of our culture. Mm -hmm. sorry, as it was a part of our culture, what else can we do so that it, we can make it more beautiful? No, wonderful question. That's a very important thing. One aspect is to understand and appreciate, like you said. The other thing is to derive inspiration from these structures and also build more structures like this. See, obviously, these have yes, stood the test of times for 2,000 years, 2,500 years, they have stood the whatever be the weather conditions, whatever be uh, the tectonic con conditions, they have lasted. So why are the buildings that we build today, such as the metro rail in Bangalore, that can collapse any moment? They took 20 long years to build it. But after three or four years of its construction, it's falling down. So there is corruption in the human mind. There is corruption in the materials that we are using. And probably we... Uh, we'll have to go back and think about the engineering Indians had back then and the materials that they used back then, which will, which made the structure last long. So that's one of the uh, practical applications that we can have today. In fact, I recently came to know, it was a very shocking revelation to me that students of architecture, students of architecture in India, they do not study temple architecture at all. They study... <laughs> Temples, which, is a, which is a very good thing, yes. They study the structure of the pyramids, which is an extraordinary thing, yes. But why aren't they studying the native Indian temple architecture? That's a very, it was a very shocking discovery for me. The civil engineers, the civil engineering students should certainly go through Bhoja, Samarangana, Sutradhara, Mayamata, Manasara, etc. and also the Arthashastra of uh, Chanukya to get an insight into residential architecture, into city planning, how beautiful was the drainage system, how beautiful was the sanitization system and the laying of the uh, city, etc. Uh, that's a very interesting study in itself. Uh, uh, somehow the education system today ignores it. So like you rightly said, uh, other than just admiring these kinds of things, we should see how we can use them to enrich our own lives. So that's one kind of thing. The other thing that we'll have to definitely do is to kind of preserve the, the temple architecture, which the temples which are present around us, because even today, there is documented evidence for this. 
every night from the indian temples today there are sculptures which are being smuggled out of india and they are being sold for crores of uh, rupees outside india so there is an interesting documentary called blood buddhas uh done by uh, it, it was shot by mr nikhil rajput of the india pride project i'm just uh, typing it here i have collected all evidence and uh, shown how uh, there is so much of destruction happening so it's also time for us to take responsibility of taking care of these monuments we live amidst history we indians live amidst history of 2000 or 3000 years so it's very important to pay attention to, to that we don't have to go to museums exclusively our houses are museums some of our houses are 100 or 150 years old some of the temples within the bangalore city limits can, are very ancient so it's our responsibility to take care of them as well thank you sir thank you okay uh, very nice sir. we can take another 5 minutes not more than that for that okay, matter sure, sure. we have a number of a number of hands risen some of the faculty members also here okay i'll take just one another question and i'll stop for the day probably uh, If you don't mind. In fact, my question has an answer. One of the students have asked that question. Uh -huh. I have one another question, uh, sir. Why in the yes. North Indian temples, uh, the hmm. architecture is not so rich as we see in the WBM style? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, well, okay. Uh, I'll just answer this quickly and uh, stop. the point is that uh, the north indian temples are largely destroyed like you like you can imagine afghanistan and pakistan were part of india like all of us know even about 70 80 years back they were uh, culturally a part of india now tell me today does any temple survive in uh, pakistan or in afghanistan the multan or mulasthana in afghanistan that uh, there was a huge surya temple uh, temple dedicated to uh, the sun god all of them have been destroyed okay. so uh, we have lost a lot of a uh, lot of temples so one cannot say that there is no architectural beauty in the north indian temples in fact if you just go to the delhi national museum in delhi or the national museum in mathura I have been there a couple of times, so I have some great presentations on the architecture and sculpture present in Mathura and uh, the ancient Delhi, which is uh, Indra Prastha. There, you see such beautiful uh, sculptures and temple architecture, which even surpasses the beauty of South Indian temples. Unfortunately, they have become museum pieces today, and they are no longer living temples. That's the only unfortunate uh, thing. It's not that in North India we never had. in north india also there were very beautiful and very richly decorated uh, sculpturally rich and aesthetic can i interrupt now thank you sir thank you very much okay can i ask some sir question now yes please yes. okay uh, uh, acquiring knowledge of uh, temples their construction hmm. will definitely uh, uh, will make uh, our children to hmm. construct uh, Uh, in a very good way which can stand stand uh, longer time stand for longer time and moreover they have got uh, their own spiritual values which are also very much important absolutely uh, yes and moreover tourism uh, it has to happen no instead of going to so many other places if the children were interested in visiting temples they can uh, even uh, uh, experience that uh, space there's uh, the uh, those spaces which are uh, going to influence them very much right thank you sir yeah absolutely thanks a lot dr uh, vandana ji i don't know i said varma right. devi oh, okay, okay. Devi. namaste please thanks a lot madam from tamil nadu uh, that's very true that's very true in fact uh, there's an entire course that i teach a 45 hour course on the different aspects of a temple so today only the engineering aspects that only some parts of the engineering aspects i have uh, mentioned <laughs> In fact, there are some very nice comments here in the chat box, such as the Ramappa Temple, which uh, does not get destroyed even during earthquakes because of the interlocking mechanism which is uh, there, and because we don't have binding materials such as uh, concrete, etc. Only some aspects of engineering I have touched on today. The entire temple structure that has corresponds to uh, correspondence to the human body. It has correspondence to the pancha koshas. namely the uh, annamaya kosha uh, pranamaya kosha manomaya kosha vijnanamaya kosha and anandamaya kosha there's a lot of spiritual significance there there are several dimensions through which one can study or understand a temple i have just uh, touched upon the engineering aspect only 
నో సార్ భాస్కర్ రావు ప్రొఫెసర్ జిఎస్ భాస్కర్ రావు Dravidian idols, that is uh, the South Indian Vigrahas, they are very beautiful. But uh, I'm saying go to the Mathura Museum and the Delhi National Museum. There you will find the North Indian Temple Vigrahas, which were extremely beautiful. The temples have been destroyed today. All of us know very well what has happened to the Kashi Vishwanatha Temple and the Rama Chinma Bhumi, the Rama Temple, the Krishna Temple, etc. See, this is uh, the famous uh, uh, Somanathpur Temple, which was looted at Lander 17 times. and uh, of late this uh, under the leadership of ke munshi the newer somnath temple has been built so north indian temples have largely been destroyed so we are one cannot say that north indian uh, temple structures did not have beauty or the vigrahas did not have beauty there are extremely beautiful vigrahas present in our uh, beautiful uh, present in our museums okay with this i think i'll con- uh, conclude for the day madam if that's uh, okay uh, yes though i mean i can see that there's so many hands risen and a lot of a lot of encouraging and a lot of a lot of uh, very nice comments all across uh, even the youtube uh, i'm sure i mean me if minudi is there she can give us a few responses from the youtube as well and uh, of course uh, with a lot of gratitude to you for your session and uh, and we really thank you for uh, Uh, giving giving our uh, participants uh, such a wonderful explanation of everything. Yes, who's there, Bitta? Ma'am, uh, is there okay, someone? someone? One, small one small request, request ma'am. ma'am. Uh, yes, the yes, chat box, box, the chat box has only been you know enabled for all the panelists. So you know whatever source sent. uh when i had asked for the sources oh. could only be seen by all the panelists so okay. i request okay. the you know panelists to you know uh, I, enable I, the I, chat I, box for uh, panelists uh, can i do one thing, thing. Uh, on the youtube i think everybody has access to the youtube link also where the session is being uh, for telecast right yes sir so there if i can uh, if i am permitted i'll put in the chat uh, in the comments there the reference uh, books which i okay. put here Okay, yeah. sir. The publisher, the author, everything I can put in there. Okay, sir. That would be yeah. so nice. That would be really yeah. wonderful. And Thank you so much, course, sir. And of course, of course, with a lot of uh, humble gratitude to you. Thank you so much for uh, uh, being so interactive with the participants and uh, uh, sparing so much of time. Of course, I think your session needed much more time than we could <laughs> we could uh, have it for you. but maybe in the future we'll have another another big session wherein uh, i mean more and more participation from the students from the participants and of course a lot of interaction would take place with these words of course i thank you for your session